18 folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country, service to people, protecting God-given rights, preserving freedoms. 13 folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind, the mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. 13 folds. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So, draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known. Let this church be a safe place, a comforting place. And let us honor those who have given their lives in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen. Stand. like to welcome you this morning and uh, pray that this will be a formidable time for each and every one of us. And so uh, it's nice to have you here this morning in the sanctuary and it's also nice for those who are at home and able to be with us in fellowship through that medium. So thank you all for being here today and we have some announcements from Rick. Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone here this morning, whether you're here in person or watching our live stream worship service from home. Since we are scrolling the announcements before the service and during the prelude, I would like to just highlight a couple of items. There will be a special meeting of the congregation at Supreme Memorial Presbyterian Church on Sunday, June 13th, 2021, immediately following the worship service. The purpose of this meeting is to hear a report of the nominating committee and to elect the, 20, the 2021 to 22 nominating committee and to elect elders and deacons. No other business may properly come before the meeting. Those not in attendance in the sanctuary will be able to attend the meeting via Zoom. In response to the latest CD rec CDC recommendations and the latest report from the Montgomery County COVID-19 update for faith-based organizations, the Supply COVID Committee has made the following recommendations which have been approved by Supply Session. 
Starting Saturday, Sunday, sorry, starting Sunday, June 13th, temperatures will no longer be required at the door as congregants enter. Reservation forms will no longer be required for Sunday worship. Worships, worshipers who are not fully vaccinated or are immunocompromised will be asked to continue to wear masks, remain socially distant to six feet, and seat themselves on the left side of the sanctuary. Worshippers who have been fully vaccinated do not need to wear masks yay, <laughs> and may seat themselves on the right side of the sanctuary and do not need to be socially distanced. If you are fully vaccinated and do not feel comfortable sitting close to others or if you simply are not ready to give up the mask, please sit on the left side of the sanctuary. This may impact some families where, for example, the parents are vaccinated, but the younger family members may not be vaccinated. In situations like this, you may decide to stay together on the socially distant side of the sanctuary wearing masks. We thank you for your cooperation and understanding as we work through this together. Next Sunday, we will honor our graduates, and Sunday, June 13th, will be our annual church picnic. Also, Pastor Don, I think he's going somewhere, would appreciate any boxes to help pack some of his office items. <laughs> Please see the church email blast and website for lots more information on happenings here at Supli. And I'd like to take this time for everyone to uh, greet one another. Aaron Wilkinson, please present yourself. Come right up here. How you doing, kid? So, when we moved here a number of years ago, one of the most welcoming things that happened was one of my new secretaries, Aaron, was able to speak a second language. Fortunately, it was a second language that I knew as well, and most of you don't speak. How you doing this morning? Let's go to let's let's go to Liberty. Oh, you mean East Liberty? Yeah. Somebody read up this room, will you, please? Give me a gum band. And give me a gum band. So we would have our own office, you know, translation, et cetera, and, and the rest of them didn't know what we were talking about, and it was great that way. But Aaron did a wonderful job as a church secretary. Not only is she a very hard worker, she's loyal to the people that she works for, she's loyal to the Lord in terms of the good effort that she puts forth every day, and now she's going to be able to be home with Chuck, so Chuck... Those lists are going to get long, buddy. And Erin also has a, a gift for it, working with dogs, and so she's helping out some rescue dogs, and that's a real wonderful ministry. But most of all, I thank you for just being the wonderful, wonderful person that you are. And you brought sunshine into the life of this church every day, and we don't know what we're going to do without your uh, sense of humor and your craziness. So there's a little something for you here, and I'm going to give it to you as soon as you listen to Karen. So just look up there. Hello, Erin. On behalf of the whole nursery school, we would like to offer you a resounding thank you. We remember when you were a mommy in the nursery school, and then a staff member in the nursery school and in the church office. And in all of those years, you've offered us and given us so much joy, so many laughs, so much real help and support that we could never say thank you enough. We wish you all the best in the years ahead. We wish you happiness and health, and we wish you'll come back and see us sometimes. So congratulations, Erin. 
Hello, Erin. Who else is that? That was very nice. You're very nice. Thank you okay, so sweetheart. much. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody. It was nice working with you and for you. Be careful. You may be seated. Thank you. Oh, you want to take that with you? <laughs> if you want me to, I'm there later. <laughs> no. <laughs> our call to worship. O oh Lord, our God, we gather together today to give you thanks and praise your greatness. We praise your mighty works of the whole world. We praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless. Your wisdom is unparalleled. Your grace is overwhelming. Your love is never failing. You promise that you will never leave or forsake us, and let us worship you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Our um, minute for mission, our new mission for the month of June, is Hunting Park Christian Academy. Hunting Park Christian Academy is a Christian school for pre-K through eighth grade in Hunting Park section of Philadelphia, one of the poorest and most crime-ridden areas in the city. Tuition is low and there are no restrictions on who can attend. Many of the children attend on scholarship, some of which is provided by Suplee's Giving and that of the Women's Association. The eighth graders all go on to high school in an area where many do not. Many go on to college and some who have graduated are now teaching there. The school expects the teachers who must be certified to live in the area to be part of the community. Supli in the past has sent work parties to help with repairs, cleaning, and painting. For many years, we collected school, school supplies to take to the school each September. Now they are gonna talk to you. Hello, Supli Presbyterian Church. Uh, we are Kevin and Jen Dean with Hunting Park Christian Academy, and we wanted to first just say thank you so much for your support over the years, especially during this year, which is has been a year like none other. And we wanted to share a little bit about HPCA with you. Now, at the beginning of this, it's just an overview of HPCA to let you know who we are and what we do. Uh, our mission is to provide an affordable, quality Christian education that celebrates a diverse community and leads children to know and serve the Lord. And all of our decision making is based on that mission that the Lord has given us. We are a pre-K through eighth grade school. Uh, this year we serve 165 students. The picture on the right are all of our students and staff. Um, we are in North Philadelphia and we started in 1999. And we started because we wanted excellence. And what makes HPCA excellent is a question we get quite a bit. And it starts with our family-like loving atmosphere. Uh, the staff is wonderful to be around. I am a, a coworker, I'm the principal, I'm a parent of two students here, and I can say that it's just been terrific. We have a rigorous and challenging curriculum we have caring mission-minded teachers and we have holistic care that's focused on the lord first and throughout all of it one of the most important things in our mission is that we are committed to remaining affordable parent payments only cover 35 percent of what we need to operate we rely on donations through individuals churches and corporations to cover the other 65 percent that's been very important this year especially with the pandemic as many parents that face job loss and cut hours. And speaking of this year, we get that, that question comes up so much, of course. What are you doing this year? Well, we're about to finish our year. And for this year, it's been a hybrid schedule. Uh, and students have been given the option, parents have been given the option to come to the hybrid in-person schedule or full time remain full-time virtual. And the breakdown right now is uh, about 22% are virtual, the rest are 
in our hybrid schedule, which means they're here two days a week, either Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and then we do a fully virtual Friday so everybody can see each other. We celebrate with chapel to build community. Uh, when students are here, they're distance, they wear face masks and or face shields. We have dividers, we've changed schedules. It's, it's just been a complete overhaul of what we've done. And we've been utilizing Join the City for Middle School, a, a neighboring building, and it has worked beautifully. Uh, we have four different entrances with temperature checks. We have, like I mentioned, Friday chapel and community building and Zoom classes. We have teachers with new tech setups for streaming to virtual students. It's been amazing to see their, what the teachers have done. We have free breakfast and lunch for all students every, all five days a week. It's been a year like none other. So how can you get involved in what God is doing at HPCA? One way is to pray for us. We, we send out a monthly newsletter. Um, if you would like to get on that list, you can email me at jen at hpcaphilly.org. Also, you can donate gift cards to Amazon, Target, or Staples. That's a huge help for us to get school supplies that we need now or to get us ready for the upcoming school year next year. There's also a scholarship program. Um, as we mentioned before, we try to stay affordable. Um, Pennsylvania has a scholarship program where you can get a 90% tax credit by giving us your scholarship money, donating it to our school, helping us out and helping our parents out. Instead of sending it to Harrisburg, you will know where your tax dollars are going and get a tax credit for that. Next year, we're planning and hoping for just to go back to normal five days a week, in-person instruction. And our, what we're working on right now is to address any loss of learning, especially for students who will be new to HPCA, because we have seen growth. We have seen consistency with our students, and we want to make sure we take care of any loss that may have happened and address that loss with uh, students who may not have been in person at all this entire year and who will be new to HPCA next year. Again, so please, we thank you so much. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, Spli, good morning. If you're sitting in our sanctuary with us or good any time of the day, if you're watching with us online or if you're watching with us live, good morning to you guys as well. So for today's children's moment, I want to sit here and talk to you guys about glasses. But before you tune out and say, man, I don't want to hear about Evan's glasses. This is going to be the most boring children's moment. We're going to try and make this interesting. And I promise it's going to tie in to talking about God. And that's why we're here. So these are my old glasses that I have. These are my new ones that I got. And then these are my new special ones that we're really going to talk about. Promise. Very exciting. And so actually, pretty recently, I started to get very sick. And I went to my doctor and the doctor was like, did some tests and there was nothing wrong with me. And I was like, doc, I don't feel good. And so she suggested, why don't you go see your eye doctor? And here, these glasses were a big part of why I was getting sick. See, over time, they had stopped being the right glasses for me and they had stopped to work. And now these ones work. These are the right ones, the new ones that my doctor gave me. And then on top of it, they gave me these ones. These are computer glasses because again, over time with the pandemic and working from home and being on my laptop more, that screen had started to affect me. It had started to make me sick. And so why in the world does this have anything to do with God is I want to bring up reading our Bibles. I know when you were young, it's so hard. There's so many things in here that are confusing or difficult or big words, and that's okay, right? And there are nights when you're going to forget. It's just not going to happen. Maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're too busy that day. You know, and if there's one day, and nothing's going to happen that day if you miss your Bible reading one day. And if nothing's going to happen if I sit down and work and I forget to put these computer glasses on for one day. But over time, if I continue to not wear these right glasses, I'm going to get sick again. And so again, I want to hopefully motivate you guys. I'm not trying to scare you, but motivate you. Over time, if you don't read your Bible, it does affect us. Because that's a great way that we can communicate with God. And so that's a, just a reminder here for you guys is, you know, we, the more you f forget to read your Bible, the more kind of further apart you get from God. You know, your best friends are your ones that you talk to all the time, that you see every day at school or play video games with on, online. And then your friends that you aren't as good of friends with are the ones that you talk to less often. Right? And sometimes we don't think of God that way, but if we don't do it every day, over time it will start, we'll start to see that distance between us and God. So I hope that my glasses and how I got sick over time, I hope that helps remind you guys to read the Bible. Thanks for watching.
be seated. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 18. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will heed my voice. So there shall be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This charge I have received from my Father. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Rick. Disappointed at the weather, are you? Well, I hope you won't be disappointed further. We're going to get into God's Word this morning. We're going to talk about sheep and about shepherds and about a lot of things. But before we do that, I want to tell you what came into my heart and mind, and I wanted to share it with you just for a moment. Um, when we get to this time of the year, Memorial Day, you know, I remember as a child we had parades and a big fuss and so forth, and it just seems to be getting less and less every year, and I don't know that that's good for us or healthy for us. But the COVID-19 has made it difficult for us, difficult for us to get in and out of one another's homes and to share with one another on a personal basis. But this weekend, I'm reminded of one of our former members, in fact, two of them, Jim McKeever and Stan Christensen. They were, you know, like Dickens and Fencer around here, fixing things and doing things all the time, etc. But I want to share with you just a little vignette in terms of a visit that I had before the COVID-19 with Jim McKeever. I went over to visit him at his home and he had left the door ajar, and I said, Jim, you in there? He said, yeah, I'm here, come on in. I, I looked, he was in his old favorite chair, and I said, Jim, what are you doing? He said, uh, I'm pretending. I said, what are you pretending? He said, I'm pretending that I'm in the cockpit of my Navy plane, and I'm going off to meet the enemy, and they're gonna lose. And you know why I know that? I said, because you're good at what you do. Well, that too. But he said, you know, I have a good shepherd that's always watching out for me. And it reminded me of the text that we have for today. And I'm often reminded of that when I think about Jim or when I think about Stan or some of the other individuals from our congregation now and in the past who have served well and protected our freedom. Jesus, as you know, had titles. He had names that he often extended to others. So Jesus would say things like, I am the son of man. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gatekeeper. Now, all of that is comforting for us, especially that Jesus is our shepherd. However, if Jesus is our shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep. And sheep are not the most intelligent animals to ever grace the faith of the earth. They require a lot of care, and undoubtedly, a good shepherd knows that. 
A good shepherd knows that on a cold night, the sheep are so ignorant that in order to stay together, they'll jump on top of one another, and then sometimes the sheep that are at the bottom will suffocate and die. They also know that sheep have a voracious appetite, and they'll just keep eating and just keep eating until they get bloated, and then they will sometimes die. So sheep, like us, need a good shepherd. A famous novelist, Frederick Forsyth, told the following story. It was Christmas Eve in 1957, and this young pilot was told that while he was on the border of Germany, even though it was Christmas Eve, he was not allowed to leave. He would have to stay on the base, and that was his assignment for Christmas Eve. And he was, of course, forlorn because he wanted to get back and see his family, especially on Christmas. However, later in the evening, a officer came to him and said, you and others have been released from your duty. You are free to enjoy your Christmas vacation. And he was thrilled. And so at 10 o'clock on Christmas Eve, he jumped into his single-seater vampire fighter jet and took off across the moonless sky, across the wide expanse. And as he got going, not too far, maybe about 10 miles, the plane started to fail. The engine started to fail, and the electric started to fail, and the compass that he used started to fail. Even the backup compass started to fail. And there he was over the North Sea, and he was in a state of panic because he knew he didn't have enough fuel to be able to make it. As he was flying along, praying to God that something would take place, that somebody would see him, that a miracle would happen, all of a sudden, he looked down below his wing, and there was a black shadow there with some lights on it, beckoning him to follow them. And so this plane that was flashing light guided him all the way to an airport. And when they got to the airport, the other plane left, and he landed his plane safely, and he was OK. And the reason why that happened so well is because that other plane that came along in military parlance is called the Good Shepherd. And so the shepherd plane came along and quietly did its work and rescued this man from tragedy. That's a great story. And it reminds us that we need and depend on the provision of God to watch out for us and take care of us. Did you ever dream that We'd be in a situation like we are now as a society, where our days and our nights are occupied worrying about masks and worrying about social distancing and worrying about a whole host of things that we never expected would come our way. But we're there. We're like that pilot going over the North Sea. We're wondering how we're going to eventually and when we'll eventually pull out of this. In recent months, you know, you've seen some economic scares. You've seen some small businesses go totally out of business because they just couldn't do it anymore. And in fact, I know of churches that have, in essence, gone out of serving, gone out of business because they just don't have the wherewithal to make it happen. Attendance in our church and attendance in churches throughout the land have felt the sting of the pandemic. And so, we need a good shepherd. The good news of John's gospel is simply this. We have one. That's why Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Note this. When he says, I'm the good shepherd, he doesn't say, I'm always kind. I'm always laughing. I'm always doing exactly what you do or exactly what you want. No. It means, especially if you look back and find out what the Greek says about his being a good shepherd, what it really refers to, what it really means is Jesus is saying, I'm an excellent shepherd in all ways, from a disciplined standpoint, from a provisional standpoint, I am the good shepherd. I am the excellent shepherd. I'm the Abraham Lincoln of shepherds. I'm the best there is at being a shepherd. And then to make the 
home run pitch, Jesus says, and not only that, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now look, Joe Girardi may say, you know, I, I know my players, I know them very well. And, and perhaps he does, I hope he does. But he can only do that from a human standpoint and go so far. Same is true with me. I might say, well, I, I know my flock, but I only know you to the extent that I'm able to. My humanity only goes so far. Jesus, on the other hand, being the son of God, says, I'm the good shepherd, and I'm here with you right now. If Jesus walked into the sanctuary, he could turn and say, this person had a headache last night. This person's worried about how in heaven's name they're going to pay their taxes. This person is worried about whether their child will be able to navigate going back to school again. And so Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the excellent shepherd. I know my sheep. He means exactly that. He knows our wants, our desires, our foibles, foibles, and all the things that go on in our life, and he knows them from the very moment that they take place. Beyond his knowledge of us, what follows is also important. For Jesus says, I know my sheep, and they know me. Now, the audience that Jesus was talking to was comprised of shepherds. And so they knew exactly what he was referencing, exactly what he was talking about. In ancient times, what would happen? At night, all of the sheep on the hillside would be guided into a pen, and they'd all be in the pen, the same pen, together. Now, you would think that would make for confusion, but ultimately it worked out very well. Because what the shepherds would do is put them all in one pen, and then it would only take one or two shepherds to watch them. The other shepherds could get a decent night's rest. The shepherds didn't worry about intermingling on the part of the sheep. And the reason why was this. They would line up, the shepherds would, and whistle. And the sheep were able to distinguish the whistle of their master, of their good shepherd. And they would immediately run to that safety. Apparently, if someone endeavored to try and steal one of the sheep, the sheep recognized that too, and they would go wild and crazy, and the shepherds would know that they had to do something. And so Jesus was the good shepherd, and he knows his sheep very well. Then he also says to us, look, I'm not just the good shepherd. I'm not only excellent in the terms of what I provide for you and how I love you, but I also want you to know that I am the gatekeeper. So you ask the question, well, Lord, which is it? Are, are you mostly the gatekeeper or are you mostly the good shepherd? Well, of course, he's both. For after getting the sheep into the pen at night, the shepherds would just lie down in front of the gateway to the pen. And that's how they would protect the sheep from being hassled during the evening. And so the shepherd used his body as a means of providing a gate so the sheep would stay all together during the night. And so what does that analogy mean to us? How does that affect us today? And, and how can we apply the knowledge and the wisdom of what we hear in the Gospels to what we're going to confront in the week ahead? Here's how I understand what Jesus was saying. You, you may see it differently. That's okay. Jesus is giving us great news. He's giving us the best news when he says, listen, I'm the great shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And it's great news because what we know is that he was the shepherd who would lie down his life for his sheep. And he would do that on a cross at Calvary. And that made him the good shepherd, the great shepherd, because he would sacrifice everything for his sheep. Sometimes I wonder whether I could do that. Sometimes I suspect that thought has passed your mind and heart as well. So this is good news, the best news. And so Jesus, as the gatekeeper, has certain implications connected to that. You don't get into the security of the pen, the security of an eternal heaven, without trusting in me, is what Jesus is saying in this 
passage from John. You remember what Thomas said? Thomas said, Lord, how can we believe? And Jesus said, listen, Thomas, and the rest of your pals, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In other words, I'm the best shepherd. I'm the sacrificing shepherd. I'm the shepherd that goes further than what you guys are able to do. Here's the bottom line. Christianity claims that a Jewish man who lived during the first century is the soul gate through, soul gate through which people must pass. Now, if that flies in the face of those who would feel like, well, I, I, I rather think of it as a buffet that anybody can think whatever they want and it doesn't make a difference. Thomas got it all wrong when he responded to Jesus. And so if that flies in the face of those who want a, a spiritual smorgasbord with God, then they have to decide whether they want to follow a good shepherd or they want to consider themselves to be the good shepherd or equal to the good shepherd. Jesus shared these remarks because he wants us to have a dependable faith, a faith that meets the needs that we have today. And believe me, we have plenty of them. Look, the church is not simply a tipping point. We have tried over the years to be winsome and to be extra kind. And in terms of helping people to come to know the great shepherd, I don't know how well that's worked. That always being kind and always saying that it'll all work out, that there's no loneliness connected to our sinfulness or our disobedience. You see, in the morning when the shepherds call the sheep, I want our young people in particular to be able to recognize the good shepherd, the great shepherd. I want them, if they head off to college or the service or whatever it might be, that they still have a connection with the good shepherd, with the great shepherd, and that they haven't forgotten the lessons that they were taught when they were in the particular pen known as Sapli. And so next week and the week after, you and I will both have to decide whether Jesus is just a shepherd just a man, or whether he's more than that, whether he's the good shepherd, whether he's the great shepherd, with the excellent shepherd, and if he is, then it's time to get out of the pen and follow him to the pastures that he created for us on the cross of Calvary. Let's pray together. I want to share a couple of requests with you before we go to prayer. From Bob Barrett for Judy, spinal implant surgery this Tuesday. And then for the Bonta Thomas family, for Stephen and Kelly, she had twins. Unfortunately, only the one of the twins survived. The first one, named Luke, has gone to be with the Lord. And the next one, named Colt, is uh, struggling, but doing okay each day. And then I would also ask you to pray for Bob Hagendorf, who's going to be having surgery in the next few days. So keep them in mind as we pray together. Lord, remind us, remind us every day that we have a great shepherd, that we don't have to do this life thing on our own. We don't have to make it harder on ourselves. We simply need to nourish ourselves on the love and the care that you provide for us as our shepherd. And so we ask that you will be with those who are in particular need. We think of the Bontotabas family and Bob Hagendorf and also Judy. And we ask that your healing hand would be upon them. We thank you for the service of Aaron, who gave so much of her life and energy to the ministry of this church and who did so much to help people realize that when they came into this pen, they were in a secure and safe place, a place where they could grow and a place where they could express themselves and a place where they would be ministered to because that's what Aaron dedicated herself to. 
And so we join our voices together now, sharing words that the good shepherd gave to his disciples as a way they should live, and that is also true for us. So let's share together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Rick's going to come and share a few things. We're going to sing first, and then he will be coming. So let's stand and sing together. Pastor Don asked me to uh, speak as a Vietnam veteran today. I wasn't really sure how I should go about doing this. So I just tell a few stories and then move on. But the more I thought about it, I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to give a little background because it wasn't a straight line to uh, how I ended up there. Um, for those of you who remember, 1968. Um, sometimes I think about 1968 and today, and I think this is child's play compared to what was happening in our world in 1968. Uh, the Tet Offensive was in January, February, which was the uh, North Vietnamese Offensive on American troops in Saigon. In April, Martin Luther King was shot. In June, Robert Kennedy was shot. The troops in Vietnam, we were up to over half a million troops in Vietnam at the time. Now, I'm just, I was, I was not in college, I was just, really no interest. I didn't really care what was going on at the time until 1968 came along. We had the Chicago riots at the Democratic National Convention. And I remember my father standing there watching that. And my father was screaming at the television for the police to hit the protesters even harder. That's where we were. 
1968, then we had a presidential election. I received one of those notices in 1968. That's 18. I received it. said, greetings. Um, they want me to go into the Army. And I wasn't real fond of doing this at the time, but I didn't really know what to do. And my father says to me, I don't know what you're going to do, but you better do something. I wasn't really clear what he meant by saying that, but he suggested, why don't you look into joining the, the Navy? Okay, it's a good idea. So I lived in Northeast Philadelphia, and I went down to Frankfurt Avenue and Cotman Avenue where there was a Navy recruiting station. I'm going to go talk to the Navy recruiter. So I go in the door, and I pull in the door. It's locked, and there's a sign that says, out to lunch. United States Air Force. So I walked in, and I joined the United States Air Force. The trade-off of joining the Air Force and Navy is I had to do four years as opposed to two years into the draft. I joined the Air Force in 1969, and on Mother's Day, May 1970, a friend of mine, I was stationed at Dover Air Force Base at the time, a friend of mine called and said, your orders are in, you're going to Vietnam. And I'm like, I'm going, I'm going where? Yes, you're going, you're going to Vietnam, you're departing in August. So, August, August 18th, 1970, I took off from Philadelphia International Airport. And um, I landed in Vietnam a couple of days later. I knew no one. Um, so my first night, I got in very late at my duty station, a place called Phuket Air Base. About 4 o'clock in the morning, I hear explosions. Then I hear sirens. Then I hear gunfire. And I look out the window of the barracks room I was in, I'm like, these are explosions. I could die here. I, I, it, it just all of a sudden, it hit me. So I got on the floor, and I pulled a mattress over top of me. I, that's what I did. I didn't know what else to do. And the, and the whole reality of dying uh, really hit home. Now, obviously, I was in the Air Force. I was a non-combat person. I was a mechanic, a poor one. But I worked on airplanes, and I did my tour in Vietnam. I um, came home 11 months and 29 days later, in you know, August of 1971, which will be 50 years here in a few more months. I arrived at McCord Air Force Base with 235 other GIs, all Army, all Air Force. It's just the way it was. It was always Air Mar Marines and Navy, Air Force and Army. And we came off the plane at uh, Seattle, uh, airport, and as we walked into the terminal, there were about a dozen or so individuals who chanted baby killers at us. Um, it was an eye-opening experience. The members of the 82nd Airborne were not happy with that, and a very, very ugly scene developed. I just wanted to go home. So, Home I went, and I was fortunate. Many of these guys who went to Vietnam, who were in the Army, just did two years. They went to Vietnam, and they were thrown back into civilization. Many of them were not ready to do so. I was fortunate that I still had a year and a half, and I served out my time at, um, in North Carolina. So I just wanted to read a, a few interesting, some information about the Vietnam War. Many of you probably already know this. A little over two million men and women served in the Vietnam War. 58,152 were killed, and that's how many are on the wall in the Vietnam Memorial in, D in D.C. Out of the 58,000, the Army lost a little over 38,000. The Marines, nearly 15,000. The Air Force, almost 2,600. The Navy, a little over 2,500. Eight women were killed, all of them nurses. 240 were given the Medal, Congressional Medal of Honor for heroism in Vietnam. Five who were killed were 16 years old. 60% were younger than 21. I, I, I turned 21 when I was in Vietnam. There are still over 1,600 U.S. servicemen whose remains are still missing in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Contrary to a lot of popular belief, 
especially over the protests of the Vietnam War and the draft, 70% of those who went were volunteers. It's been a long time ago for me. Um, the guys who served in combat, I, I don't know how they did it. I was very, very, very fortunate that my time there was in a non-combat role. I hold no animosity towards anybody left from the Vietnam except for one. Um, you can't ask a Vietnam veteran about Jane Fonda without getting a reaction, and I'll just leave it at that. So I appreciate Don letting me to, um, to uh, share this with you folks. So if you would now stand and uh, we all sing the, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Some of the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to have the benediction, but before we do that, I thought it would be helpful for us, and I, I thank uh, Rick for sharing this morning. That's not an easy thing to do. Why don't we just take a minute or two silently to pray on our own, and then I'll give a benediction. But pray for those who lost their lives. Pray for those who were negatively affected by it, and, uh, and pray that we will not forget both Vietnam War, World War II, World War I, all the times when freedom was put in a risky position. So let's pray for a moment, and then I'll give a benediction. And please stand, if you will. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, to glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and even forevermore. Amen. Thank you for being here today.